Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MIF Plus Plus seminar. Today, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Alexandra Volokhova uh, from uh, MILA AI Quebec Institute in Canada. And uh, briefly, Alexandra is a PhD student uh, working with Yoshua Benja, who might be uh, well known in, in computer science, at least as the most high <laughs> cited researcher in the entire subject of computer science. Uh, today, uh, Alexandra will talk about Crystal G-Flow Net. Over to you, Alexandra, please. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's my pleasure to uh, to give a talk uh, at your seminar uh, about our recently uh, published paper, Crystals Gflonet, uh, sampling crystals with desirable properties and constraints. Uh, and we have a, a big group of researchers who've been working on, uh, on this uh, paper. And uh, as, you, as you may notice, the first author of our paper is the team name. And it's our way to acknowledge that uh, traditional ordered list of orders may not represent well the contributions of, um, of each researcher. And uh, everyone uh, in the team contributed significantly to make this work happen. And yeah, that's my pleasure to present our work today to you. So let's start. Uh, and I will start just with brief motivation, uh, which um, motivates our work. Uh, so one of the uh, biggest challenges uh, which we have in our times is the climate change and global warming. And as um, IPCC uh, recent reports suggest, uh, the speed up uh, in discovering new materials, which can help to make uh, uh, improving energy and materials efficiency and improve how we yeah how, how we use energy how we use materials in uh, in in real life in production uh, these breakthroughs are really needed to uh, to slow down global warming and to limit it to uh, to uh, 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius and that really motivates us to uh, to put our minds and hearts to towards developing uh, new materials. And um, I'm not a material scientist. I'm a PhD student in AI. And it's an interesting question how AI can help uh, to tackle these challenges regarding scientific discovery. And um, the problem with the traditional approach uh, in scientific discovery is that uh, the search space is very large and that hypothesis testing is very expensive. So if we want to find some new material, we uh, have a lot of different um, options to try. And uh, if we were to uh, conduct experiments with all of them, it would take a lot of time, uh, which we do not have, uh, given the pressing needs to, to develop new materials. And also uh, in the current state of uh, technologies uh, and com computer technologies especially, uh, there is a growing gap between uh, stored observations and captured knowledge. And AI can help a lot in analyzing uh, this data and uh, specifically proposing new hypotheses, for example, material candidates for experimental trials. And uh, the specific part of uh, AI models uh, which can help with that are generative models, which uh, can generate uh, new uh, examples uh, based on the analyzed data. And apart from analyzing the data, uh, the specificity of scientific discovery is that we have a lot of prior knowledge. And it is something uh, which uh, we also want to include when developing generative model and uh, that will be an, an important this is also an important part of our work uh, as I will explain you later so uh, what what is specific about material discovery is that as I said uh, it is a very huge space but it also uh, has a highly uh, it is a highly structured space and that's something we are uh, we are going to make use of when developing the model. 
also uh, there are multiple geometric and chemical constraints and uh, it is something which is important to take into account when uh, generating new materials and uh, also we have uh, like depending on the application uh, we may have various specific properties uh, which we want uh, the material to have. For example, we want it to be stable. Sometimes we want it uh, to have high electric conductivity and so on. Um, so uh, let me first give you uh, some motivation why, uh, why we decided to try GFLONET for this task uh, based on the prior works uh, about this model. So GFLONET is a generative model and I will explain you in the framework in more detail uh, a bit later. Uh, but uh, the thing to know now is that it is a generative model. And uh, for this generative model, uh, it is designed to generate some objects according to a given reward function. Uh, here I denote it as R of X, where X is a generated object and R of X is some reward function. And when we're talking about materials, it, it can be uh, some um, quantifiable metric of specific property uh, which we want our material to, to have. Uh, for example, it can be estimation of the energy of, of this material, or it can be estimation of the electric conductivity and so on. So this is some quantifiable property and uh, GFLNET can, uh, is designed uh, to generate uh, objects uh, proportionally to to this um, property. So if we, for example, have um, um, energy function as, as the reward, uh, let's say we have uh, like negative energy function and we want to find uh, we want to find materials which are stable, so with the lowest energy. Um, Diffelnet will be able to generate uh, generate materials from the minimum of the energy. Uh, and um, what is uh, good about this model is that it can generate diverse uh, candidate, it uh, diverse samples. It doesn't uh, stick to uh, a small amount of modes uh, as it usually happens with other methods, for example, reinforcement learning methods or um, of a traditional uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And uh, besides, uh, like, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, apart from that, uh, apart from diversity, uh, it is also possible to incorporate prior knowledge uh, in into the sampling. And I will explain you this a bit later, how, how we specifically do it in our model. And uh, also uh, we, uh, we can uh, get some amortization of the sampling costs um, compared to traditional methods like MCMC. And it means that uh, to uh, get, uh, like one, once different, different method is trained, uh, we can sample uh, new, um, new objects uh, quite cheaply compared to uh, methods like MCMC, uh, which always take a lot of time to get new independent samples. And also it possibly allows for systematic generalization, uh, which means that um, if there is a structure uh, in the uh, reward function, if there is some underlying structure, for example, like on this, uh, on this plot, we have uh, four modes, uh, which are structured in, in, in some way. And during the training, Jufflenet has seen only these three modes. Um, just because this algorithm is based on neural networks, there is something trainable inside, it is possible uh, that uh, it can generalize and find another mode which it, uh, uh, which it hasn't seen during the training. Um, and also like Excellent. this plot is from the, yes? I could ask a quick question on, on that particular sure. slide. Uh, could it be, is it possible to, to already describe the states or the space from which you are sampling? Describe the space from uh, which we are sampling. Um, like for, for this specific work, I will uh, I will get to it in, in a bit. I have ah, like the, several slides about, about the space itself. For now, yeah, just covering the, the general things. But okay. if you want, I can move uh, a bit faster if, if, if the audience is familiar with different. It's fine. So for crystals, um, 
just to clarify briefly, will it be a discrete space or a continuous space? It will be a mixture. Some parameters will be uh, discrete and some parameters will be continuous. Okay. Yeah, thank you. A any other questions, by the way? Yeah, feel free to, to interrupt me if, if you have questions. Okay, uh, then let's move on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let me briefly um, tell you what's the <laughs> default. Uh, and uh, yeah, I will not go into all the details, uh, but I will try to give you just a picture, which is enough to uh, to understand our work. So, as I said, uh, default samples objects, and uh, these objects are sampled proportionally to some given reward function. and during the training, uh, GFLNet um, needs to have access to this reward function to um, inquiry this, this function about uh, values of the reward function. And uh, the generation in the GFLNet is always sequential. So we start from some initial state and then step by step, uh, GFLNet uh, builds the object. And in this example, um, and Dupont builds um, just uh, molecular graphs uh, by adding some fragments to the already uh, already uh, built uh, molecule. Um, and um, we usually start from some initial state, uh, which is some abstract uh, empty state, and uh, go on uh, by building objects. And at some point, we terminate uh, either when we uh, reach some valid state from which we can terminate uh, or if we uh, set a particular number of, uh, of steps uh, which are like limiting the generation. Uh, but anyway, we uh, end up in some valid state which we can pass to the reward function and uh, give uh, and, and get the uh, learning signal from the reward function. And um, uh, when, uh, when generating the uh, the the object, Diflonet follows uh, what is called the forward policy. It is uh, some it is some policy which is modeled by a neural network, and it is basically a distribution over over possible childrens of each node in this direct graph. Uh, and this is the main thing which we want to get out of the Diflonet training. We want to know uh, this uh, generation policy, which will allow us to generate uh, new objects. Uh, but besides from the forward policy, uh, we often uh, have uh, additional uh, policy, uh, which also um, can be trained. Uh, and it is a backward policy. And it is policy for kind of erasing the object for going backward from the uh, final sample to the initial state. And uh, this policy uh, is usually not used for generation because uh, we want to generate uh, objects in, in the forward direction. Uh, but uh, it is helpful for training, GFLNet at least, uh, because it allows for finding more flexible uh, forward policies. And uh, by the way, if you are familiar with diffusion models, uh, GFLNet is Diffonet is resembling um, this uh, these models uh, due to the sequential generation, but in the diffusion models, uh, backward policy is always fixed and it is kind of limiting for them. And in some other works, it was shown that Diffonet has this um, advantage uh, over the diffusion models be because of the uh, trainable backward policy. Okay, so we have this backward policy and uh, the loss function which we are using in our work is the trajectory balance loss function, uh, which is computed on the trajectories uh, during the training. So we sample some complete trajectory when we start from initial state and uh, finish at the final state. Um, and uh, this, uh, this equation uh, is just uh, um, probabilities of this, uh, of this trajectory. Uh, computed using the forward policy and uh, computed using the backward policy. And uh, I will not go into all the mathematical details, but the idea of this loss is that it uh, tries to match probabilities, uh, probability of sampling this trajectory forward with probability of sampling this trajectory backward. 
and also match the probability of the final sample with the reward function. And it can be shown uh, that if uh, this loss is um, zero, uh, then default net uh, samples uh, from the uh, from the reward distribution. Um, yes, and also like two important notations which will be uh, used in the further slides. We have state space, which is the the space of all the possible uh, states which default net uh, can visit. And we also have sample space, uh, which uh, is like this part of, of the state space, uh, which are valid, um, uh, valid samples from the default net, which we can evaluate with the reward function. Um, okay, any questions so far about the model or anything else? For, for this application uh, for molecules, could you clarify yes. by a molecular graph, do you mean an abstract combinatorial graph, possibly with, say, uh, um, atomic types? Or is it a geometric graph embedded into a three-dimensional space? Uh, could, could you just clarify what is geometrical yeah. graph embedded in the dimensional okay. space? Okay, yeah, maybe a simple question. What do you mean by a molecular graph? So here it is just a two-dimensional two planar graph when we have nodes and edges, but we do not know their positions in the 3D space. Okay, um, so I guess you don't fix positions of atoms in the plane, so this is simply a um, combinatorial graph in this case. Yes, yes, okay. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, so let's first uh, briefly, uh, uh, briefly touch on the description of the crystals, and then um, I will explain you how we design the model to generate crystals. So uh, crystals, uh, they can be, uh, so crystals are periodic structures. Uh, so it makes sense to talk about uh, about Bravia lattices when we work with the crystals. And uh, for the like most simple description of the crystals, we can uh, use lattice parameters to define the lattice itself. And also we need to know basis, uh, basis atoms and their positions uh, within the unit cell. And this is enough to describe uh, the whole crystal because uh, given the lattice, lattice parameters, uh, we can uh, translate the basis vector uh, in the space and uh, we can translate the basis atoms in the space and it will give us uh, the full description of the crystal. Um, so this description is simple, but it uh, doesn't um, give us enough information about possible symmetries, which are uh, quite important uh, for many properties of the crystal. So there is another way um, to describe uh, crystals, which is more hierarchical and which also um, make it explicit uh, how um, like what are the uh, structure structural symmetries in the crystal so in our work we were using this hierarchical description and uh, within the description there is the composition uh, which is the atoms which are present within the unit cell and uh, like uh, uh, amount of of each uh, element uh, and also the base group is important characteristic of a crystal and uh, space group uh, itself, uh, it, it corresponds to the symmetries uh, which are present in the crystal. But within the, the space of the space groups, there is also some structure and uh, all the space, group, uh, space groups can be divided to 32, can be divided according to 32 point groups, which, they, which are present in, in, the, in the space groups. And also there are crystal lattice systems um, which I will explain in, in the next slide. So another important thing is the lattice parameters and uh, we also, our model is modeling them as well. And the final thing which is needed to, uh, to get the full description uh, of a crystal is atom positions. It is not something we already have in the model, but this is the, uh, the most important uh, future work which, uh, which I'm working on right now. Um, so yeah, and just an example of uh, of a description of a crystal. So this is the natri uh, natri chlor, and um, the space group is 
fm3 bar m and the crystal lattice system is cubic and uh, it imposes particular constraints on the lattice parameters and uh, this is uh, some important information which we're also using in the model um yeah so like this is just just an example to make sense of <laughs> of this uh, description and now let's uh, talk about the model itself so as i said uh this um, um space this more hierarchical structure of the space is uh given it, it gives us explicit information about uh, important properties of the crystal so we are utilizing that and the sample uh, space of um, the, the state space of the triflight is a product of several um, state spaces uh, the first one corresponds to the composition the second one corresponds to the space group and the last one corresponds to the lattice parameters and here i uh, derived this example with uh, uh, with uh, natri chlorom uh, in in this representation and yeah also so the sample space uh, is uh, the same product of composition space group and lattice parameters um and with this representation it is um, uh, it becomes uh, much easier to introduce specific uh, chemical and, and geometrical constraints. Um, so let's start with the composition. The composition in our case it is just a vector of um, of counts for each atom. And uh, here um, for for the natri chlor uh, we have n and chlorum just two atoms and all the other atoms are zeros. Um, and within the composition, we introduce constraints for charge, charge neutrality. And the model designed in a way that um, it uh, will, it, it, it cannot terminate sampling unless uh, it is, uh, it, unless it is satisfied that the composition is uh, charge neutral. Um, so this is the composition part. And then after generating composition, the model generates the space group for this composition. And uh, the space group is also generated in some hierarchical way. I will explain it in the next slide, but for now, just let's just think of it as just one number which corresponds to the space group. So the space group should be compatible with the composition because not uh, every space group is allowed given particular composition uh, because of the symmetries we may have in the space group not any composition uh, can satisfy uh, the specific symmetry of the space group so when we generate space group we um, do not allow to uh, generate space groups which are not compatible with the composition uh, and after generation of a space group uh, the model generate lattice parameters uh, which are also constrained uh, given the space group. Uh, and for example, for this space group, for uh, it, it, it is a cubic space group. So the constraints uh, are that uh, all the um, all the lengths of the lattice vectors are equal and all the angles are equal to 90 degrees. Um, OK, uh, any questions so far? Alexandra, although you are not a chemist, is it possible to give a brief example of a simple composition uh, that is not realizable by a simple space group? Simple composition not realizable by a simple space group. Um, so uh, the, uh, there is some space group which I do not remember the name of, but um, I know that... Um, it, it is like highly symmetrical and um, the positions which atoms can occupy, uh, they they have some multiplicity within the space group, which means that if we position atom in a particular place in, in the unit cell, we will need to, um, to uh, put it in some other positions to respect the symmetry. And uh, some space groups, uh, they have... Uh, quite high multiplicity, um, quite high minimal multiplicity. Uh, and some, I don't remember the name, but there was some space group which has a multiplicity of 16. It is the minimal multiplicity for 
uh, for for all the possible positions of the atoms. And it means that if we put like one atom of, I don't know, lithium, we will need to repeat it 16 times uh, uh, within uh, the cell. So if we have some composition which we have less than uh, 16 atoms of, uh, of this type, we just will not be able to satisfy the symmetry constraints for the space group. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Um... Yeah, thank, thank you, Alex, for the comment in the chat. So, so now I understand better. So it's a restriction on the number of atoms. So it's, yes. Because chemical composition could be interpreted in the way, say, it's simply water, H2O, that's it. But you, you might need um, several water molecules in, say, in a crystal, right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Here we we do not allow to to multiply this composition. So composition is the exact number of atoms we have in the so, cell. Okay, thank you, Sandra. <laughs> um, okay, now let me elaborate a bit more about the space group subspace. So, as I said, uh, we uh, the main thing we want out of it is the the space group, and there are. 230 possible options for the space group uh, but the space group space itself um, has some structure within it and uh, we um, will make use of uh, this structure uh, to inform um, the model about it and uh, yeah we hope that it uh, kind of helps to um, to learn uh, the the sampling of the space group better so the first uh, thing which um uh, sorry <laughs> let, let me start again so the um the sample uh, in the space group consists of just three numbers and the first number corresponds to the crystal lattice system and it is uh, a like combined uh, parameter uh, which is which is combined from the crystal system and from the lattice system and crystal system is um, is the way to uh, to categorize uh, point uh, point groups uh, according uh, to uh, to the crystal system, uh, and uh, the idea is that uh, this uh, crystal system it uh, divides the space of point groups to the to the specific uh, non intersection groups, and uh, it is uh, useful for um, uh, for our purposes, because it will allow us to divide the space group in this non-intersection groups and kind of narrow down the search space. So if the model samples the this, this crystal system first, after that we have fewer options for possible space group. Um, but uh, crystal system is not enough for us because we're also interested in the constraints for the lattice parameters. So uh, we combine it with another um, categorization, uh, which is lattice system. Um, and uh, lattice systems, they are similar in terms of the names um, and this separation to the crystal systems, but they do not coincide perfectly. So that's why we have these eight uh, combined crystal lattice systems, uh, triclinic, monoclinic, orthorhombic, tetragonal, tetragonal rhombohedral, tetragonal, hexagonal, 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 and cubic. So given this number, uh, we first can uh, separate uh, point, uh, point groups to, uh, to non-intersecting groups. And we also have the constraints for the lesser parameters. Um, OK, so the other thing is the point symmetry, um, which uh, helps us to um, find specific uh, point group uh, given the crystal lattice system. So uh, if both crystal lattice system and point symmetry are sampled, then we uniquely define the point group. And then given the point group, uh, we have uh, uh, we have um, a specific uh, uh, subspace of space groups from which uh, we can sample the final space group. Because space groups, they are also divided into non-intersecting uh, groups. Uh, according to the uh, point group. So this uh, um, this is maybe a bit uh, elaborated, but yeah, the idea is that 
we want to sample space group and we want to make use of this uh, uh, structure within the uh, within the space and that's why we introduce all this uh, all these additional parameters and in this um uh, in this space, uh, GFLNet is allowed to sample these um, this this parameters in any order. It can start with lattices, uh, with crystal lattice system, with point symmetry, or with the space group. And once like one of them is sampled, it uh, introduce it may introduce some constraint to others. So if the space group is sampled, then the point symmetry and crystal lattice system are uniquely defined. Um, but if the crystal lattice system is sampled, then we have some restrictions for space group, but they're not uniquely defined. So we, um, yeah, we also make use of all these uh, geometrical constraints. Um, okay, uh, now let's move on to the reward function. So as I said, uh, Diffelnet needs to have access to, to the reward function and uh, uh, it will query it uh, many times during the training. And uh, for, our, um, for our task, uh, we uh, decided to start with the formation energy uh, and um, to compute it uh, um, precisely, uh, it will take a lot of time for crystals. So uh, we decided to train a, a neural network uh, to predict formation energy uh, based on the uh, mat mat bench data set. Uh, so in our case, reward function is given by this proxy model, how we call it. And it is basically a um, multi-layer perceptron, which uh, takes the uh, sample from the GFLONET. So this X corresponds uh, to the composition, space group, and lattice parameters vector uh, embedded um, in, in some way. And uh, after that, it outputs uh, the prediction for the formation energy. And here we uh, were using this parameterization. So we take exponent of minus predicted energy divided by temperature, which corresponds uh, to the Boltzmann distribution. And here the temperature is treated as a hyperparameter of the model. And the um, proxy model uh, for the energy itself uh, achieves uh, a good uh, validation uh, score at the uh, at the validation data set. Uh, so we um, uh, just from the, this model, we see that there is a lot of information within uh, within the um, within this representation of composition, space group, and lattice parameters, uh, which allows this model to predict quite well the energy of the of the crystal. Uh, and um, yeah, it's um, it's a good insight which tells us that uh, even without atom positions, it is possible to um, to get some understanding of how stable the crystal can be. Uh, okay, so this is our reward function, and then for the experimental setup, um, we started with uh, uh, smaller scale uh, experiments. Uh, but uh, yeah, the next step is to uh, to make them bigger. So we started with just 12 elements and up to 50 atoms in the co composition and up to 16 atoms uh, per element. Uh, we also restricted uh, to 113 space group and lots of parameters uh, within these rangers. Uh, and um, yeah, we uh, we had uh, 50,000 uh, training iterations with uh, uh, 500,000 queries to the proxy model. Uh, and it took about uh, 12 CPU hours to train the model. And uh, the results which we have, um, we analyzed in two ways. One was uh, the energy distribution of the sampled uh, of the sample structures. And then we also try to analyze the diversity of them. So let's start with the energy. Um, here it is the, the plot uh, which uh, uh, which represent the uh, the distribution of the formation energy predicted by the proxy model for uh, different different uh, sets, and uh, the blue one is the um, is the uh, samples sampled from the from the trained model. Uh, the orange one is the validation set, and um, the uh, pink one is uh, the uh, 
set uh, sampled from the uh, randomly initialized model. And um, we see that um, uh, once Deflet is trained, it, uh, the distribution of energy moves quite a lot towards the negative energies, uh, which is physically meaningful. And also it, um, it doesn't co coincide with the validation set, with the validation set, but it also um, it is not expected to perfectly coincide with the validation set because uh, as I said, the trained GFLOID, it uh, should sample uh, from the from the distribution defined by the reward function, but the validation set for, for the uh, proxy model is not necessarily sampled from this distribution. So we, we do not expect these two plots to coincide, but uh, it uh, makes sense that uh, GFLONET, uh, the, the, the range of the samples moves towards the validation set. Um, okay, and the uh, yeah the other analysis is the diversity. So as I said, uh, we expect Jeffonet to sample diverse um, diverse set of samples, and uh, in uh, in our experiments we found that um, in the top ten samples uh, according to the reward, so the lowest energy uh, the lowest energy crystals which Jeffonet sampled, uh, all the twelve elements are present. And all the five point symmetries are present in, in these top ten samples, and also in uh, in ten uh, thousand samples uh, there are uh, fifty five percent of the of the space groups which are possible to sample, and uh, we also looked at uh, the distributions of uh, the cure, uh, of the co occurrences of the elements, and. Uh, for this, for the Dufonet uh, sampled set, the, this distribution is similar to the distribution in the validation set, and um, the same is true for the distribution of the elements themselves. We see that Dufonet can sample all the all the elements present uh, in the uh, in the validation data set, and yeah, as I said, these distributions should not coincide, uh, so we do not expect that. Uh, but uh, it makes sense that um, they kind of correspond to each other. Um, okay, so uh, the conclusion from uh, from this work is that um, our model it uh, allows for sampling in inorganic in structures uh, with uh, any property of interest. We took the formation energy, but uh, we uh, can take any other property. Uh, which uh, which is interesting for specific application. And also it is possible to accommodate chemical and geometrical constraints within the model. Uh, and preliminary results are promising. And for the future, uh, the, um, the most uh, interesting thing is to try to incorporate atom positions, uh, also uh, explore different properties for the reward function. So not only formation energy, but something else. And uh, also um, have a more a chemically informed evaluation of the diversity. It's uh, yeah also something we are uh, looking into. What would be the more um, like the more important uh, things to look at uh, given specific application? Okay, I think that's that's it. This is the last slides, and yeah, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Alexandra. Let us first uh, thank Alexandra for the nice presentation, please. Yeah, physically, virtually. So thank you very much. So uh, let me then uh, stop the recording and